Good evening and welcome to the last Monday webcast for February presented by the State Association of Fire and Emergency Districts or SAFED. I'm your host Clay Avery. Uh, tonight's webcast does count for one hour of that state required ESD commissioner training. Uh, the webcast is certified and sponsored by the VG Young Institute for County Government, part of the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. Now, at the end of the program, all the way at the end, you stick with us, you'll be given your instructions on how to apply for your one hour of credit. Tonight's webcast, as usual, does give you the opportunity to ask questions. You can call in, text in, fax in your questions, or even email in your questions at any time during the tonight's broadcast. Here's how. You can call us at 512-251-8101. You can fax us to 512-251-8152. Uh, email us at safed at texas.net, and that's Texas spelt out, T-E-X-A-S. Uh, and you can text me here in the studio at 512-567-0857. Normal text messaging rates may apply, and please do not call that number. I always got, got to remind people, don't call that number during the show because I can't answer it live on air. Um, tonight, we're welcoming a familiar face, Kelly Carlton from the Carlton Law Firm PLLC. Uh, now, due to some inclement weather here in the Central Texas area, Kelly is actually going to be joining us via Skype, um, and we're very happy to have her, her familiar face coming to us um, from her office in Austin. Um, bear with us. This is the first time we've tried this, but we think it's going to be pretty cool, and, uh, and it's, it beats getting Kelly out on the uh, icy roads. Um, so we're really happy to have her, and Kelly um, is a graduate of the University of Texas Law School. Uh, with more than 20 years of experience in law firms and as a sole practitioner. She is an attorney with the Carlton Law Firm here in Austin. Uh, tonight, she's going to discuss the basics of ESD operation. Uh, there are many ESD commissioners who have just been appointed uh, there in January, and you'll benefit from this presenta presentation, as, of course, will the veterans um, who can get a quick refresher course. Uh, we always hear from, from people who have taken our ESD 101 and come see to Kelly at our conference and they see they do the uh, how an ESD works presentation and they generally always come out saying oh yeah I learned something new even if they've been doing this for years so Kelly welcome and take it away thanks Clay um, this is a, a fun and different way to present this to to everyone not only do I not see you uh, you guys made me clean my office so I don't know if that's a plus or a minus but I'll say thank you uh, so so let's get started my presentation is a, a just an overview of ESD operations. By no means can we hit absolutely everything you need to know in an hour. We couldn't hit it in a day. But I'm going to try to hit the high spots, let you know what you need to take away from this, uh, this talk tonight. If you have questions, we'll try to field them at the end. Um, but this is, your, this is your overall overview of what an ESD is or what it should be. So let's look at that. What is an ESD? Um, ESDs are local political subdivisions that they may provide uh, fire or EMS or both. Um, they're typically uh, appointed, uh, five appointed commissioners, except for in certain counties in Texas, uh, Harris, Orange, and Smith, they are elected. And then in multi-county ESDs, they're also elected. But for most of you in the state, you've been appointed by your county commissioners uh, and you'll serve uh, basically uh, based on their appointment. Uh, ESDs are primarily funded by property taxes and we are capped as an ESD, uh, cannot collect more than 10 cents per hundred dollars evaluation. That's always a, a difficult budgeting issue for a lot of ESDs, uh, but that is our constitutional cap. So 10 cents per hundred. Uh, we will switch over to basics. Let me give you an overview of the basics that we'll talk about tonight. Um, an ESD is a local governmental entity, and that's important to know because you are not, as an ESD, an arm of the county commissioner's court. Uh, the ESD is its own governmental entity. Uh, some county commissioner's courts are hands-off, some are hands-on, but one thing you need to understand as a commissioner is you are running a local government. 
you and your, your fellow commissioners are running a, a little piece of government every time you meet. So as long as you keep that in mind, you'll go, you'll go far and you won't make many mistakes. Uh, the topics we'll get to tonight, taxation, open meetings, open records, fiscal accountability, which is your audit, uh, when you buy or build stuff, uh, ESD structure and contracts, and the limits on your authority. So let's talk about ad valorem taxes. So these are ad valorem taxes or property taxes. As I said, we're, we are stuck with a cap uh, of 10 cents per hundred, but simply because the maximum is 10 cents per hundred, that doesn't mean that every ESD out there is, is, uh, is levying that tax. Many, many ESDs in the state are still at three cents or five cents or six cents per hundred. Uh, so you may find yourself in that range, and that's not unusual at all. Um, every ESD is subject to the truth and taxation process because you're a taxing entity. Um, take away from this that, because we could talk about taxes a long time, but recognize that if, when you get the information from your county on your tax rate, if you want to exceed what they list for you as your effective rate, you're going to be subject to some additional rules and laws uh, on notice and hearings. Uh, if you're not going to exceed the effective rate that you're given by your county when they calculate it for you, uh, then it's a little bit simpler. But take that away. Note, just note that if you want to cap or go over your effective rate, you may have some other notice and hearing requirements. If you're a small taxing unit, uh, you, you collect under 500000 in a year or you are less than $0.50 cents, uh, per hundred, which of course everyone would be, uh, but most of you collect much more than 500000 If you're a small taxing unit, your requirements under the truth and taxation process are even smaller. Uh, so if you have questions as a small taxing unit, talk to your lawyer and they can help you walk through the process. It's designed that way to help a smaller taxing unit uh, move through, through the process early, uh, easier rather, and with less expense. Uh, a ESD would be subject to a rollback election if you go more than 108% of your previous effective rate. Um, most don't raise that high. If you are already close to the 10 cent cap, you're not going to get 108%. Uh, higher, you're not going to end up being subject to rollback. But say you were at three cents and you are authorized to go to ten, if you jump from three to ten uh, in one year or try to, you can be subject to a rollback election. So just again, put that in your pocket and recognize that it's a possibility. And if you have specific questions, be sure and talk to your uh, legal counsel about that. So let's look at the Open Meetings Act. So the Open Meetings Act is it found in Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code. Um, every commissioner, all five commissioners in your ESD are required to have the Attorney General approved training. It's online. I always tell people it's about as exciting as watching paint dry, but it's a requirement. Uh, so make sure if you are a brand new commissioner, the law requires you to have taken this training within 90 days of taking your oath. So your, your clock is running for most of you. Uh, if you are sworn in sometime in early January, uh, please be aware that your clock's running. So when you do this open meetings training online, uh, there's a link down here to the uh, Attorney General's site that'll help you get there. Uh, although the new Attorney General may have move things around a little bit. I didn't check my hyperlink. Uh, so just be aware. Go to the, the Attorney General's website and look for uh, open meetings or open records training and you'll get there. Uh, the open meetings made easy, in quotes, there is the smaller version and the uh, user-friendly version of the open meetings laws. If you want a primer on basic open meetings questions, that's a good place to go. Uh, it's online. If you want a paper copy, I believe you can request one from the AG's office. It is much shorter than the Open Meetings Handbook, which is large um, and, and very fun to read. Uh, I say that tongue-in-cheek. 
we're going to move to the next slide. So for open meetings, because you are a governmental entity, uh, you must have, ESDs must have an open meeting, uh, meaning you can't meet in secret. So in order to have an open meeting, you must post notice of your meeting 72 hours in advance of the meeting, unless there's an emergency. And I, I typically advise people, uh, you're not going to run into many emergencies. And an emergency is not, I forgot to post the agenda. That will never count. Uh, so make sure that if you want to meet on Friday, that you posted your agenda by 2 o'clock, uh, excuse me, by Tuesday before your meeting, not 2 o'clock. Make sure you posted your agenda. If you want to meet on a Friday, post it at least 72 hours before, which would be on a Tuesday. So your agenda, your notice, has to state the time, the date, and the place of your meeting. Uh, it needs to alert the public where you're meeting and the time. And typically, ESDs post their agenda with the county clerk in, the, in your county and in your administrative office, wherever that may be. Um, your agenda, your notice, has to describe the matters to be discussed uh, sufficiently, meaning um, you need to tell the public what you're going to talk about. And the, here's my rule of thumb. If a stranger could walk up to your agenda, read it, and understand what you were going to talk about and potentially vote on, then you've written a good agenda. But if you write an agenda that says, we're going to discuss new business or we're going to discuss old business, that doesn't tell a member of the public exactly what you're going to talk about. So your agenda should say something to the effect of, uh, if you wanted to talk about the contract with your VFD, here's a, here's a for instance, discuss and consider contract with, you know, blank VFD, which, whatever the name of your VFD is. That would give the public notice of exactly what you're going to discuss and that you're considering either agreeing to it or changing it or something like that. Um, that would be an adequate description of, of an item on an agenda. The public has a right to attend your meeting. They do not have a right to speak, and there's a huge difference there. Um, I suggest that your agendas have on it a place for public comment. Many, many ESDs put their public comment at the beginning of their agenda so that if a member of the public comes in, they can come in, they can say their piece and leave. Some ESDs put their public comment at the end of their agenda, which is meaning the public sits there through your whole meeting and they speak at the end. That's up to the commissioners where they want to place that on their agenda, but I strongly suggest if you don't have it on your agenda that you, you put a public comment section on there. Um, you should have an item on your agenda if you, if you don't have this public comment section to talk about how long do you want to give a member of the public to speak. Do you want to give them two minutes, three minutes, five minutes? That should be decided by the board and at the very least put into your minutes that you the board decided that we were going to have a public comment section. It's going to appear on this place on my agenda and it's going to be each member of the public can speak up to three minutes. That tends to be the average, three minutes. That gives the public a right to speak. They feel like they're being heard, but they're also not taking over your meeting. Uh, so you, you're giving them a spot to air their grievances or give you input, and then you can go on with your agenda. So the public has a right to attend. They don't have a right to speak unless you give them that right. So under the open meetings, I'm at the next slide on closed sessions. Um, you can, during an open meeting, go into a, a, what I'm referring to here as a closed session. You would announce in your meeting that you're going in for a specific purpose. And here are some of the purposes. The biggest one is usually to consult with the district's attorney on some legal issue. Uh, another reason you can go into closed session during a meeting is if your ESD is going to purchase property and you need to talk about that acquisition because you don't want to talk about your negotiations to buy a piece of property in open session because the seller could be sitting there and then they hear all of your negotiations about purchasing their piece of property. That's why the law allows you to go into executive session to talk about real property uh, acquisition. If you have personnel, meaning employees, 
uh, you can go into executive session to discuss personnel matters. Now, most, uh, many, not most, but many ESDs don't have actual personnel. They have contractors or vendors. Contractors and vendors are not personnel, and they cannot be discussed in a closed session. Only actual personnel employees of the ESD. Uh, and a, another example of a way to have a closed session is if you're getting a gift. Uh, someone wants to donate land to your ESD. Uh, maybe they don't want everyone to know. Uh, maybe they want to donate money to uh, put in a plaque or some memorial or something like that. Uh, gifts to the district can be discussed in closed session. The key to a closed session is to not make any actions, take no votes in closed session. It's not allowed. All votes must be done in open session. So you can go in and you can have consultations. You can talk about your real property acquisition. You can decide what you, you know, your options are. But you have to come back out into open session in order to have the vote on whichever of these topics you may have discussed in your closed session. Um, so if you happen to go into a closed session, have your minutes say at you know 7:20, the board went into closed session or executive session. And when you come out, say, well, the board, uh, in your minutes, the board came out of executive session at 7.30, no action was taken. That, that way your minutes reflect that you didn't do anything in closed session that you were not supposed to do. Um, okay, let's talk about open records. The Public Information Act uh, is the official title of the open records. I keep referring to it as the Open Records Act because that's the way I learned it. Old dog, no new tricks. So Chapter 552 of the Government Code is the Public Information Act. As a governmental entity, the ESD is subject to the Public Information Act. Again, there is required training for this uh, understanding this act because it's not necessarily uh, intuitive. Um, so make sure you get this training 90 days from your the date that you were sworn in. Again, the, the AG's office, the Attorney General's office, offers a Public Information Act made easy, which makes me laugh because it, it's helpful, but there's not a lot that's easy about it. Uh, it's a good, again, a good primer, answer some basic questions. If you need lots of detail, you can look at the Act itself in Chapter 552, or take a look at the Public Information Handbook um, and maybe that will answer your question. Um, the, the Public Information Act, we will going to go to the next slide and talk about it a, a little bit more in depth. So the basic assumption is records collected or created by the district are public. That's the overarching uh, rule to take away. So what you also need to understand is that your VFD's records can be subject to the Act as well, even though your VFD is a separate entity, it's a private entity, it's a charitable organization, their records can be subject to the Act because they're supported, at least in part, by government funds. And the law goes through and explains why that matters. The AG's office has opinions on it. So just recognize that, that your VFD can be subject to the Act just like your ESD. That's your takeaway on that one. So let's switch to the next public information slide. So why does it matter? Okay, public information matters particularly when a member of the public makes a request. So you get, say you're the president of your ESD or you're the secretary and you get something in the mail or you get an email that says, I want to see all the records related to your contract with your VFD. So that's the, that's the request. That request triggers the act. It also triggers a time frame for responding. And you need to be very aware of it. So one good thing to do is check your mailbox. Don't wait six weeks in between checking your PO box if you are an ESD that doesn't have a, a staff to check the mail for you. Um, important because the time will run. Um, when a member of the public asks for documents, the government, the ESD, 
is supposed to respond, but you don't have to create records to respond. So if they asked for a list of something and you don't have a list of that, then you can respond, we don't have any documents uh, in that category. Um, you don't have to do legal research. And if they send you a questionnaire, I've had a, a clients get questionnaires that somebody wanted them to answer. You do not have to answer a questionnaire as part of a Public Information Act request. It's simply to look at existing documents. Documents can be electronic, too. So keep in mind that um, as an ESD commissioner, your emails and your text messages as, as an ESD commissioner, if you're conducting the business of the district, can be subject to the Act. So one of the best things you can do for yourself is to make sure that you have a um, email alias for your ESD work, you know, kelly at esd1.com or, or whatever your particular district wants to do. Very easy to create email addresses for the five commissioners. I recommend it. That way, if you do get a Public Information Act request that asks for your communications on a particular uh, issue, whatever that issue could be, you've got it in that email box and you're not searching through your personal Yahoo account looking for it. And you're not making your personal Yahoo account potentially open to someone looking at it, someone being the Attorney General's office. So that's my uh, takeaway on that. So let's go to the next Public Information slide. Uh, this is the question I get the most. Do we have to produce this? Typically the answer is yes. Um, there are many exceptions in the Public Information Act on things that can be withheld from production. However, the ESD can't decide on its own to withhold those documents. If you think that there's something that may be subject to uh, an exception for production, you must submit that document and you must submit the issue to the Attorney General's office within 10 business days of receiving the request, which is why I say it's important to check your mailbox. Um, if you are on the 11th business day and you submit that to the AG's office, they're going to tell you you're too late, produce it, regardless, unless you've got a really outstanding reason, they're going to tell you to produce it. So recognize if you're going to make an argument that there's an ESD document that should not be produced, you have to do it within 10 business days of receiving the request from the member of the public. Charges. I, we get questions about charging for records. Yes, the charges are allowed under the law. However, you must comply with the, the Texas Building and Procurement Commission's rules on charges. The there's, there's also some language in the government code on what can be charged and how it's charged and how you provide this information. You cannot simply make up your own uh, charges and, and it be okay. Because you are a, a Texas local government, you've got to follow the Texas state law on what the rules are for charges for providing public information. If it comes down to that and you need to dig around, the, the Building and Procurement Commission's rules are a good place to start, and the AG's office will have some information for you as well. Uh, it's a good question to ask your legal counsel, too. All right, so we've talked about open meetings. We've talked about public information. Let's talk about your audit. So by June 1, you have, if you're multi-county ESD, then you're going to uh, file it in both, count, both counties. Now, Harris County is very large and it has some exceptions because of its size. Their deadline is extended, um, again, because it takes a long time in Harris County with the size and, and the number of ESDs. They have a little bit of an extension, July 1 uh, deadline, and, or, and they file it within 30 days after they receive their, their audit. So with your audit, um, remember that your auditor must actually be a CPA. Can't be your bookkeeper. Can't be your secretary. Uh, you need an independent certified public accountant or firm to do your audit. So somebody completely different. A lot of ESDs hire a bookkeeping firm or a bookkeeper to do their books. That person cannot do their audit. The, it's a checks and balance idea. 
So if one person does your books, the auditor is looking over the books that were created by the bookkeeper. And the bookkeeper is looking over the files and the finances that the secretary and the treasurer and the, the board have voted on. So it's, it's a definite checks and balances idea behind the audit. So there are some recent audit exemptions on the next slide. And this was put in place because so many small ESDs were spending quite a portion of their yearly budget to have this audit done. Uh, and before, I believe it was two sessions ago, um, every ESD had to do an audit regardless of size. But this audit exemption, if you happen to, to uh, be a commissioner in a smaller ESD, if your ESD does not have bonds and it collects less than $250,000 a year in revenues, um, the ESD can prepare a compiled financial statement instead of an audit. And the compiled financial statement, it's still done with a CPA. It's still supposed to be done in, you know, with an independent CPA. But it's a lower level of financial accounting, and therefore it's less expensive to an ESD, a smaller ESD. I mean, if your budget for the year is 50000 and an audit would cost you 7500 that's a huge bite out of a small ESD's budget. So if you are, if you file, if you fall in that category, look into the compiled financial statement and have that done for your ESD. You will file it with the county commissioners just like you would an audit, but that will save your ESD a little money. Not a lot, but some. Okay, the next slide on audits. This is where I tell you that if the, if you want to get fired as a commissioner, here's what you do. You don't turn in your audit by September 1. Um, the law says that if a district fails to complete and file their, their required audit, um, and the county auditor is not required or ordered to prepare the report, the board president and the board treasurer are automatically removed from their positions. Automatically gone as of September 1 if that audit is not filed. So you've lost your job. Um, and if, you're, if you have a four commissioner board at that point when two folks lose their job, all of a sudden you can't transact the business of the district because you don't have a quorum. So make sure, unless you just really want to be fired, and I, again, I say that time in cheek, make sure your audits turn in on time. That's, that's, the, that's the biggest takeaway. Get it in before September 1, by all means. Um, and, but this rule for removing the president and the treasurer are only going to apply in those counties where the uh, commissioners are appointed. If you are an elected commissioner, you're not going to be fired for not getting the audit in because you're, you're elected and the law says your constituents will decide whether you should be reelected or not. So um, that's, that's, the, that's the, the difference between being an appointed commissioner and being an elected commissioner. So let's talk a little bit about bidding. This is where we get into the stuff, the, the, the stuff of, of running an ESD. So if your ESD wants to buy a uh, brush truck, and that brush truck is going to cost more than $50,000, you're going to need to get bids at, on the truck. And if you strictly go by the bidding, and I'm going to talk about some exceptions, but if you strictly go by the bidding, you must take the low bid. So there, there are exceptions to every rule, and we'll get there. But here is your basic rule. Anything over $50,000 for one item or service or more than one of the same item in a fiscal year. So um, an extreme example would be, if you think you're going to buy $50,000 worth of uh, fire hose in a year, you would need to get bids. That's pretty extreme. But it, it gives you an idea of, you know, if you bought $20,000 in January and $20,000 in June and you were going to need another $20,000 in September, then you need, you need to have known and planned and get your bids on the front end. If you didn't on the front end because you weren't aware, you've got to get bids on the back end. Uh, as you're cresting that so that you're complying with the law. The district can solicit bids for lesser amounts. If you, if you want to, you can, but it's that $50,000 mark where you must submit bids. But 
as with everything in the law, there are exceptions. So let's talk about a couple of them in the next slide. So some of the bidding exceptions. Um, for the purchase or lease of real property, obviously each piece of real property is its own unique thing. And so you can't get bids on a unique piece of property. So that's an exception. Um, if, there's only, if there's an item or a service that the boards determine can only be obtained from one source, that's a little tougher, particularly in this day and age when we can get on the internet and we can find stuff all over the world at the touch of a finger. Um, you know, it's a simple Google search. Um, that one's a little bit harder these days to, to say that there's only one source. But if there were, if there was some new something on the market and there was only one source for it, you do not have to get uh, bids for it. Um, highlighted in bold is one that's particularly important to ESDs. You do not have to get bids for your contracts, uh, for your fire services, your ambulance services, your, re your emergency rescue services, and you do not have to get bids for the purchase of bunker gear because none of us want our firefighters in low bid bunker gear. So even the law recognizes that as a bidding exception. You do not have to get bids for vehicle fuel or the purchase of insurance. And in the next slide, um, if you have an emergency expenditure, um, let me use the Bastrop fire as an example. Um, if one of the ESDs in Bastrop had lost an engine uh, in the Bastrop fires a few years ago and they had to have another one because the fire is still going on, that could be an emergency expenditure. The board would need to meet, the board would need to say that it's an emergency, we don't have time to look for bids, we've got to get a truck and we need it right this minute. That would be an example. Um, but it's such an extreme and rare thing that you're going to have an emergency to spend the money. Um, most of the time getting bids is, 98% of the time getting bids is going to be what you need to do. So the, these next three are exceptions that I'm going to go into a little bit more. If you have a contract uh, to participate in a general services commission or a state purchasing program, a governmental co-op purchasing program, or you're going to buy through the federal supply schedules of the U.S. GSA. Um, those are bidding exceptions, and, and that doesn't make a whole lot of sense until I take it to, let me show you the next slide, which is uh, some the bidding exceptions for the cooperatives. And you may know these by their names. Um, the local government purchasing cooperatives, I've only listed three. There are many more than three. Uh, one is buy board. Uh, another's HGAC, and then there's another one run by the state of Texas, which is the state of Texas co-op. Um, any three of these, or there's one in North Texas, uh, there are several. Uh, the, the idea behind the purchasing co-op is that the co-op has already gone into the market, looked around, gotten the best pricing it can get for all of its members, and uh, that way you do not have to go through the bidding process. However, you must be a member of Buy Board or HGAC or, the, or a co-op in order to take advantage of going around the bidding rule. So it's simple. There's, if, you're not, if your ESD is not a member of one of these purchasing cooperatives, it's very easy. You can look any of them up on the, on the internet. Um, they do require an application. They do require a resolution of the board to join, but there's no fee to join. So uh, you are not paying to be a member of a cooperative. What you're doing is when you purchase something, the fee is worked into the purchase price. Uh, and uh, with, with vehicles, there's a little bit added, I think, for, for the purchase of a, literally you can get a fire truck through one of these cooperatives. Um, but you're not, you're not paying a monthly fee to be a member of it. So uh, I'm not associated with any of the cooperatives. I, any one of them will work uh, just fine if that's what you're interested in. But it does help an ESD um, save time when it wants to purchase something and avoid having to go through that, the bidding process every single time they want to buy something big, you know, uh, mostly for, for your purposes, trucks. Um, or other equipment. You can, get, you can get something as simple as pencils through it if you want, uh, but you will be surprised if you're not a member 
uh, you'll be surprised at what your options are if you go on and you look, you look at these co-ops. All right, so let's look at bidding exceptions uh, for building things. So those co-ops are if you want to buy stuff. The bidding exceptions on building things, which is the next slide here, uh, you can get around the bidding uh, requirements through these four options under the law. So you want to build a station, let's say. Um, and going out for bid is, is a labor-intensive process for the board who are commissioners. Um, they're not hired staff. They don't do this. You guys don't do this 8 to 5 every day. So these options allow you to uh, find a contract or uh, an option to, to build something that takes you out of having to make every single minute decision in your building process. Competitive sealed proposals, design build contracts, uh, construction manager as agent, and the construction manager at risk. These four options are very distinct and they are defined at length in the government code. Uh, if you are looking at building something, building, adding on, and you, you want to add a floor to your firehouse, you want a new station, um, you name it, uh, look into these options or ask your counsel to advise you on them because they can be a time saver. Uh, different ones are more appropriate in different situations and uh, I, would, I would commend them to you if, if what you're trying to do is, is build a building. Uh, it, will, it will make the lives of the commissioners, or can at least, uh, a little easier. So let's talk about types of ESD operations. There's a quote from a commissioner who said some years ago, and he was right, if you've seen one ESD, you've seen one ESD. Uh, every one of you uh, in every ESD across the state is different. There's no two alike. I, I like to call it Baskin Robbins. It's not that there's anything wrong with all the different flavors, it's just different flavors of it. It's run differently. And part of the reason is these options on the screen. Um, some of your ESDs are staffed by all volunteer departments. So your volunteers have real jobs during the day or during the night. They're volunteers as they can, they can come in and help. Some ESDs are combined departments where, say, perhaps you have a paid chief ESD chief, uh, but all of your firefighters may be volunteers. That could be a combined department. And then the larger ESDs, uh, if you happen to be a commissioner of one of the larger ESDs where you're mostly employees, uh, your firefighters are paid employees, your chief is paid, you have, you have a, a whole rank and file who are paid, you've got a different uh, type of ESD than the all volunteer or the combined. Typically, the employee departments come in to being because there's insufficient volunteer manpower. You can only tap your, your local folks for so long uh, before they just can't do it anymore. And that's what ESDs run into after a certain amount of time. And so they look to having at least maybe some employees, maybe not all, but that's, that's three different versions of an ESD just by, based on who's staffing your, your, your firefighting. So going to the next slide, what structure will work? And the reason I'm going to talk about this is as commissioners, you should take not only a short view of what's happening this month, uh, I would recommend that you take a long view. What's happening this year? What's going to happen next year? What's going to happen five years from now? You may or may not be an ESD commissioner next year or five years from now. I don't know. But a, a, a good idea is to look at the structure of your ESD and start thinking about, is it working now? Will it work in a year? And could it be working five years from now? And if the answer to that is yes, then great. If the answer to that is no or we're not sure, you might want to start considering how to, uh, to work with your departments, how to work with your ESD, and, and alter that structure so that it will be beneficial to your taxpayers for well beyond your term as a commissioner. So here's some things to consider, and we'll go into these in a little bit of depth. The attitude of your community, 
um, the existing structure of your ESD, uh, whether you're going to be subject to future city annexations, uh, the regulatory impacts of your ESD, and your access to grants and loans. So let's talk about the first set of considerations, which is the attitude of the community. So a lot of times with an ESD, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to be preaching to the choir now, you're going to understand this. Your volunteer fire department was there before the ESD was there, and in some cases long before the ESD was there. So there's going to be a history of, of support and involvement by your volunteer fire department. Now, there could have been also a desire to help the volunteer fire department by creating the ESD, which is this government involvement. Um, but then there are also political concerns, because now we've got a VFD and we have a government. Uh-oh, now what have we got? And we have the county commissioners that we have to answer to. So you're keeping all of these balls in the air. How are we going to make sure our taxpayers are satisfied? Our VFD has the equipment and the manpower that it needs, and how are we going to run this ESD with the amount of money that we take in every year uh, effectively and um, well. So let's look at the next slide on considerations, which is the existing structure. When you're, when you're looking at your ESD in this, you know, now, a year from now, five years from now, with those glasses on, um, and you're looking at your volunteer department, is the organization of your volunteer department good? Um, is it effective? Is there something that should be changed? Is there something that, that should be improved upon? Keep these ideas in your mind as you're, as you're looking at how to best run your ESD. Let's look at the next slide. Are you subject as an ESD to future city annexation? For some of you, this is a very big concern, and for some of you, not so much. Um, if a city removes territory from your district, you're going to lose tax revenue, and it's going to be lost and gone forever. Uh, so that that's going to impact your ability to um, pay your debt. If you have debt as an ESD, it's going to impact your ability to make your improvements, uh, to run your trucks. All those things will have an impact. Uh, that city removal of territory and the loss of that ad valorem uh, tax income can really have an impact on an ESD. Now, that's if a city is removing territory from your district. Some of you, some ESDs, have cities that are wholly inside of your district. Um, that can create its own interesting issues. Uh, for instance, like a conflict over who's going to control the fire service. You know, if the city gets big enough and has enough money, are they going to want to run their own fire department as opposed to using the district? Um, there can be conflicts over tax revenues, particularly if we're talking about sales tax. So these are considerations that your individual ESD has to think about and continue to think about because they're going to be issues for you if you happen to fall into one of these categories. Let's go to the third slide here uh, on considerations on regulatory impacts. So. If, if your uh, department has paid staff, you're going to be subject as an ESD to the Texas Commission on Fire Protection Regulation. Um, if you're all volunteer, this will not apply. But you need to keep that in mind. You have staff, paid staff. And the next slide is access to grants and loans. Some grants and loans are available only to volunteer departments, volunteer fire departments, and some grants and loans are available only to political subdivisions. So if it is advantageous to get grants and loans in your ESD, in your particular situation, um, if you have a VFD that you contract with, then have, have them look into grants and loans that they can get, and then on your end, the governmental end, look into grants and loans that your ESD may be able to get to help with your uh, revenue, your overall revenue, your ability to operate. Okay, let's switch over to the organizational structure, the next slide. So ESD contracts for services. Um, first of all, if you, if you have a, if your ESD is not completely employees, 
then you have a service provider providing service to your ESD, at least in part. You, you need to have a contract. If, if your ESD does not have a contract with a service provider, you need one. Um, so the contracted service providers, the ESD is really the, if you will, the financing and the contract manager, and I mean that in loose terms, um, for the third party service provider, which can be the, the VFD, a volunteer EMS organization, a for-profit EMS organization, and uh, if there were other local governmental entities involved, uh, like ESDs cooperating together, for instance. So the ESD in this situation is kind of sitting at the top and, and providing the money and uh, the contract to, to these organizations. As opposed to, in the next slide, the ESD as an employer where the, the district has its personnel and the ESD is employing its personnel and they're completely providing their own services to the community. An ESD with personnel is going to have more regulation. You're going to be subject to employment laws. You're going to worry about taxes and you're going to worry about, you know, does, does the Affordable Care Act apply depending on how many employees you have. Um, there's a lot more consideration when you start to hire employees. Um, that you don't have if you simply contract with your service provider, your VFD, your EMS, whichever. Okay, so the next slide is on service providers. Um, and we touched on this a little bit. The volunteer departments have usually were the ones that helped create the ESD, which is an important thing to keep in mind. Um, they have a long history of serving the community. They've had lots of volunteers over their time that it that invested their time and energy and service to the community. Um, VFDs were used to and are used to relying upon donations uh, to run. And in some counties, they were fortunate enough to get uh, some money from the county itself. That's not true across the state, but some counties did provide or still do provide some money. So they, they, the VFDs are very used to operating on very little income. Um, and they're used to making decisions without oversight. So when, when you transition to a VFD uh, with the ESD on top, managing basically or it, with the contract oversight, that can cause a rub between the VFD and the, the ESD. And you need to be aware of that. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. And in fact, many VFDs work very well with their ESD commissioners and under their contract, but expect if you have not gone through the process with your VFD in a while, or if you have a new service provider, um, you may have a difficult transition um, just because of these, these things with the VFD being used to running its own show, and you can't blame them for that. But if you're sensitive to it and you recognize their concerns, you recognize the concerns of your taxpayers and the needs of the ESD, you can work through this. Okay, so let's talk about service providers in the next slide, contract negotiations. So I'm going to throw out some ideas. Um, if you have a contract, and you should, with your service provider, you need to look at that contract every year. I'm not saying you need to change it every year. But you need to look at it, and you need to make sure that it says what you need it to say and that your service provider is doing what you want them to do. Um, things change. The law changes, the personnel changes, the commissioners change, circumstances change. So a contract that you put in place 10 years ago may not be the contract you need today. So take a look at your service standards, for instance. Um, has your service area increased or decreased? Are the services that you're getting from your service provider, are they good? Uh, are they complying with training? Are they complying with the regulations? Uh, do they have operational standards that you're aware of? Are you in on, do you get bad information from them? Do they report at your meetings? Um, how's their response time? Is it good or does it need to be improved? So you look at their service standards. Let's look at the next slide. Uh, more, more service standards, their personnel. 
and I touched on this a little bit, uh, how many people do they have serving in their volunteer ranks? Are these people trained? Um, are they following the ESD policies? Uh, whatever those policies may be. If you have a policy, you need to have it in writing in your minutes or through resolution. Uh, and if you have any requirements of your contracted service provider, they need to be in your contract. Um, so keep that clear. Don't, don't try to spring anything in your contract. If you want to change something, make sure you do it in writing. Um, another important thing is the ownership and the maintenance of assets. And that was a big deal when the law changed about who owns what. Um, the takeaway on that is um, I like to say that once government money, always government money. So if the ESD has put in money to buy the fire truck and the VFD is using the truck, that doesn't mean that the truck belongs to the VFD. Uh, it means that the ESD has an ownership interest in that truck. Regardless of how it's titled, the ESD is going to have an ownership interest. Even if the ESD paid the money to the VFD and the VFD went and bought the truck. Still government money going through the VFD. So the ownership and the maintenance of the assets is, an, is a thing that the ESD really needs to have a handle on. Do you get an accounting from your VFD? Do, they, do you know what they bought last year? Do you know what they're planning to buy next year? That's important to know. And your records and your reporting. Your VFD should be reporting to you at your meeting every month. And if they can't be there, they should probably be submitting something to you in writing. Because you have a duty to your taxpayers to, uh, to be able to explain where their money's going. And if you never get a report from your VFD, you, you really can't explain that very well. Let's go to the next slide on your contract negotiations. So some of the provisions you may want to consider are having audit requirements for your VFD, particularly if they're a very large entity. If you're a large ESD and they're, they're, they're a big VFD, you may want to have the VFD audited as well. Um, the ESD can offer to pay for the audit. But that way, again, it's a check and a balance. It's making sure that the taxpayer's money is being followed and spent in the way that you, the board, intended it to be. Um, you can have some purchasing limitations. Uh, here's a, for instance, you know, if the VFD wanted to spend more than $10,000 on an item, they need to come to the board for approval. That would be one, one way to put that, or $5,000 or $2,500 or whatever your limit is. Um, insurance, who's going to buy it? Is the ESD going to buy it for the VFD? Is the VFD going to buy it and the ESD reimburses? Uh, how, how is that going to work? That should be laid out in your contract. And by the way, everybody needs insurance. The ESD needs insurance. The VFD needs insurance. You need separate policies. They can, be, they can both be out of the same company, but you need separate policies. Um, and then budgeting. How are you going to budget? That's a very, very important uh, topic to have in your contract. When do you budget? How do you budget? What information do you need from your VFD in order to budget? That should be in your contract. So let's go to the next slide. The term of your contract, um, usually they're a year. Some of them automatically renew. So most of them will say, you know, it's for a term from the beginning of the fiscal year to the end of the ESD's fiscal year, automatically renews until terminated by one of the parties. That, that's pretty typical. That's why I say you need to look at it every year. Uh, because if you need to change something or if you would need to terminate it, you need to be aware of the term of your contract. Um, your payments, you can set up your payments to your VFD, whatever way works best um, for your, your entity. Um, you need a termination clause, whether you think you'd ever terminate it or not, trust me, have a termination clause. And assignment, you want to be sure that as the ESD, your VFD doesn't assign its, its contract with you to someone else. Um, you want to be in control of who you contract with. So you're, you should have an assignment clause in your contract that says something to the effect that um, this contract is not assignable without consent of both parties. That will take care of that. All right, so I'm about to run out of time. I'm going to speed up because I'm just about done. Let's go to oversight and assistance. And I'm going to go to the state agencies with oversight slide. Um, 
we talked about the Texas Commission on Fire Protection. That applies if you have any paid firefighting staff, one or more. Um, the Department of State Health Services applies to entities who provide EMS services. The AG, the Texas Attorney General, uh, applies to all of you, uh, every single ESD in the state, because of the open government and the open records issues. And we're going to switch to the next slide, which is um, organizations and agencies for assistance. Um, you have the SFFMA, which is for volunteer departments. The Forest Service uh, can help with grants. Uh, the Department of Agriculture is where you send in your report faithfully every year, uh, even though there's not a human being that actually looks at it um, because there's no money for it. Um, SafeD can help you get that filed. That way you comply with the law, which is very important. The State Library and Archives Commission for your records and the records retention policies. Uh, the comptroller can help you with sales tax, the truth and taxation every year when you've got to do those notices when you're looking at your ad valorem tax rate. And if you're going to have elections, then the Secretary of State is going to come into play, as well as all the election laws. Um, those, that's a handful, and, it's, and they all intertwine depending on what you're doing in your, in your ESD. I've given some helpful websites here at the end. Um, SafeD's website, the Attorney General's, the Comptroller's, Secretary of State, and the Department of Agriculture. And my last slide is on uh, laws that apply to the, the ESDs. I gave you my top six, which is based on, um, well, just my opinion, really. If it weren't for the Constitution, you wouldn't exist. So that's got to be number one. The Health and Safety Code, Chapter 775, that is primarily where you find the laws that govern ESDs. Um, as we talked about tonight, there are laws all throughout the government code and the election code and the tax code that also apply. But if you're looking for the very basic law that's going to apply to an ESD in, in most situations, you're going to be in Chapter 775. Uh, just don't look at it with, with tunnel vision because, no, there's a lot of different things that apply. Government code for the open records. Um, I also have listed the Government Code, Chapter 2267. Those are those alternative bidding procedures, which I have misspelled. I'm sorry, I'll fix that. Um, when you're building stuff, when you're building a, a depart, uh, like a fire department or a firehouse. Tax Code and the Election Code. Those are my top six. And that's me. If you have questions, feel free to email me, and I will take questions, Clay, if anybody has any. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. <clears throat> um, you know, I... Uh... I uh, saw you had the quote, the, if you've seen one ESD, you've seen one ESD. Can you hear me all right? Oh, yeah, I hear you fine. Uh, I, I, I heard, saw that quote, and, you know, that usually is attributed to Don Grog, former safety president and uh, Harris County ESD-9 commissioner. But there's a local Austin attorney that swears he actually came up with it. Um, <laughs> John something or other, you might know him. I don't um, know. Yeah, that guy, yeah. Yeah, you sure. might have heard of him uh, yeah, here I don't, there. I don't, I don't think that was his. <laughs> well, anyway, um, we're gonna, we've are gonna we got a couple questions in the queue really quickly. I do need to issue the disclaimer. Kelly is not your attorney. Um, even if she is your attorney, for the purposes of this webcast, she is not dispensing actual legal advice. Please consult with your own counsel, even if that is the Carleton Law Firm. Is that, is, did I do that well enough? That's a great question. Okay. Uh, first question, um, do ESDs have governmental immunity? They do. Yeah, you're a local governmental entity. So, yes, you, you will have a certain amount of governmental immunity, yes. Okay. Um, do commissioners D need uh, D&O insurance, uh, directors and officers insurance? No, um, that that's more, uh, I can see where you might have that question, like if you've been in a, a municipal utility district or something like that where they're, they're bonded. The treasurer of an ESD tends to have a bond, um, but the, all the commissioners aren't required. So there's a little bit of difference in the law. Okay. Um, and I think we're going to have to take just one more question here that's in the queue. Um, can you go to, can an ESD go into executive session uh, to discuss an, an, an ESD commissioner, a, a member of the board? 
No. Uh, they are, they're a public official. They're not personnel. Okay. Very good. Very concise and uh, to the point answers. I like it. Um, okay. Well, thank you, Kelly, so much for being here. As usual, a incredibly informative presentation uh, packed with a lot of stuff. As you said, we could go days on how an ESD works, but uh, uh, thanks for hitting the high points, and I'm sure uh, everybody gets something out of that, no matter how much you uh, think you know already about ESDs. Um, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, we want to let you know about an exciting ESD educational opportunity coming up later this month. Uh, that's going to be in Woodville, which is in Tyler County, out there in East Texas. We're seeing our East Texas folks. Um, on Saturday, March 21st, uh, Safety um, and Austin Attorney Ken Campbell will present his popular VFDs from A to Z course, and that's going to be at the Tyler County Emergency Management Center. Uh, check our website, www.safe-d.org, for more information and how to register for that. Uh, now, to apply for the one hour of credit for tonight's webcast, um, we're going to go to www.safe-d.org slash last Monday 15026r.pdf. That should be below my face right now. Um, and the PDF is going to prompt you to use a password. That's going to be Windjammer. Uh, all one word, all lowercase, W-I-N-D-J-A-M-M-E-R. Once again, that's www.safe-d.org slash last Monday 15026r.pdf. Um, and the PDF password is going to be Windjammer. W I N D J A M M E R. That's one word. That's all lowercase. That's our webcast for tonight. Uh, special thanks to Kelly Carlton from the Carlton Law Firm here in Austin. Uh, for joining us via Skype. We broke new ground tonight technologically. I hope it all worked out for you guys out there. It seemed to be going well in here. Um, now keep checking the safety newsletters, both print and electronic, and our website for more information about future webcasts and training opportunities. From the safety headquarters here in Pflugerville, Chile Pflugerville, I'm Clay Avery. Thanks. <laughs>